Chapter 4 It was possible to live at Dragonwick with the Van Rins and twenty servants, and yet be virtually alone, Miranda soon discovered. Nicholas was busy with the state affairs and divided the rest of his time between his study, on the top of the high tower, and the greenhouses, where he pursued his hobby of horticulture. A hobby shared by many wealthy landowners at that time, but astonishing to Miranda, who perfectly understood a man's growing plants for food, or barter, but found it hard to comprehend an interest in ornamental and quite useless shrubs. It was Nicholas's pride to have one example of every tree which could be grown in that locality, and many of these he had imported by schooner from Europe and the Orient straight to the Dragonwick Dock. The incense cedar, the weeping cypress, the Judas tree, the ginkgo with its fan-shaped leaves, and the delicate bronze Japanese maple. These were hardy enough to live outside. But the palms and aloes, the oleanders and the orchids, grew in the elaborate greenhouses or in the conservatory off the dining room. Johanna, too, had her own pursuits. If food and spasmodic attempts at genteel handiwork, china painting, purse netting, or crochet, could be called pursuits. Her weight made her lethargic, and she kept much to her room unless there were guests. Miranda accepted this sense of separateness in the household, just as she accepted the surprising discovery that husband and wife occupied different rooms. Here at Dragonwick, all was to her strange and surprising, no one aspect more than another. These were the ways of the aristocracy, the exalted group whom she envied and to whose pattern she longed to shape herself. Her only duty consisted in trying to teach Katrina. Every morning after breakfast, the two of them retired to the sunny schoolroom, where Miranda patiently repeated, B-A-T, bat, C-A-T, cat, R-A-T, rat. Now you spell them, dear. The child was docile and did her best, but she was slow and her memory was poor. Her attention continually wandered. She gradually grew fond of Miranda, who was always kind, but the little girl continued to prefer the company of her beloved Annette, who fed her sweets and told her stories. So Miranda had little to do, and during the first weeks the novelty of this method of living sufficed in itself. It never occurred to her that it might be the occasional contacts with Nicholas which gave meaning and excitement to Dragonwick. But she did know herself to be passionately grateful for an act of generosity which he had shown her. On the day after her arrival, Magda, the housekeeper, had presented herself at Miranda's door, armed with a tape measure, paper, and pencil. She would explain nothing except that Menhir had sent her. Her lips were compressed into a thin line. She pushed and pulled the girl about roughly while she took measurements. A week later, at dusk, as she mended a rip in the despised merino, there came a tap on Miranda's door, and the housekeeper entered followed by a footman. They carried bundles, boxes, and a small cowhide trunk. "'Some things from New York Meneer ordered,' said Magda sourly in answer to the girl's exclamation. The woman paid no attention to Miranda's cry of excitement, but unpacked the bundles and the trunk with swift efficiency. She laid the clothes on the bed. There were two silk dresses, one green with black velvet trimming on the flounces, one a rose evening gown festooned with blonde lace. And besides a blue cashmere morning dress, there was a pelisse, a green bonnet, two pairs of kid shoes, an ivory fan, a beaded reticule. There were also more intimate garments at which Miranda stared with dazzled confusion, a flowered muslin negligee, linen nightshirts trimmed with fine lace, petticoats, camisoles, even a pair of whalebone stays. But how could Mr. Van Ryn, I mean, for sure he didn't order all these things, cried the girl, blushing, and divided between embarrassment at the nature of the garments Magda was phlegmatically spreading on the bed and delight at their daintiness. Magda shot the girl a contemptuous look. You don't think the patron bothers himself with such business. He sent an order to Madame Duclos in New York. Last summer, we had a French orphan from New Orleans visit here. He did the same. Oh, said Miranda. The color deepened on her cheeks. 
There was then an unpleasant aspect of charity to this gift, and her staunch Yankee heritage gave her an unexpected twinge. And was it quite proper to accept things like this from a gentleman, even a cousin? Oh, but what nonsense, she told herself hastily. He would be annoyed if she made a fuss or refused the clothes. He would think her countryfied and silly. And the clothes were so beautiful. She smoothed the rose satin of the evening gown, entranced to discover that beneath its heavy folds there was the small bell-shaped hoop for which she had yearned. Madame Duclos had neglected nothing to fill Nicholas' written order. Send complete wardrobe for young lady, fair-haired, quite tall, and of the following measurements. The modiste had also included a plush-lined box containing Guerlain's lustral water for the hair, Siroe de Bouby, warranted to enhance even the most delicate complexion, Oris tooth powder, rice powder, and a vial of heliotrope perfume. It smells just like Ma's little garden on a summer night, cried Miranda, sniffing the vial. Oh, Magda, isn't everything lovely, gorgeous? The woman did not answer. She knelt before the bureau, neatly folding away lingerie. The belligerent set of her thick shoulders under the black bombazine expressed rigid disapproval. Why don't you like me, Magda? cried the girl on impulse. Have I done anything wrong? The woman rose heavily. It's not my place to like or dislike, miss. Mavrao is waiting. She clicked the last drawer shut and walked out to go to Johanna. Is it because Johanna doesn't like me that her maid is so unfriendly, thought Miranda, puzzled and rebuffed. But she was not yet sure of Johanna's dislike. That broad, flabby face seldom showed any emotion at all, and on the rare occasions when she spoke to the girl, it was with her usual vague amiability. She's like a turnip, a fat white turnip, thought Miranda, and forgot Johanna in the excitement of dressing herself in the green silk gown. It fitted perfectly. The bodice taut across the small high breasts and slender waist, the skirt full and gracefully billowing over the hoop which she had transferred from the ball dress. If her skin and her hair had been pretty above the muddy merino, now against the clear leaf-green silk they were startling. The color enhanced her blondness as it brought out new lights in her hazel eyes. Perhaps, with luck, she might find Nicholas alone downstairs and thank him for his thoughtful kindness. There was still half an hour before supper time. She hurried downstairs, and the rustle of silk that accompanied her gave her new assurance. She held her head high and swayed her hips a little so as to increase that luxurious swish. She found Nicholas in the conservatory examining a slipper orchid, which he had just brought in from the greenhouse. He turned and surveyed her as she approached through the dining room. But the girl's really beautiful, he thought, astonished. She has the body of a dancer. Cousin Nicholas, she said shyly, I don't know how to thank you. All these grand clothes, they... You've made me so happy. I'm gratified that it takes so little to make you happy, Miranda. Usually she was daunted by his tone of repressive irony, but this evening she had more courage. She smiled, thinking that men never liked to be thanked, at least Pa and Tom didn't, and she moved close beside him and touched the striped green orchid. How queer a little flower it is, she said. Is it doing well here? As she bent her head over the marble urn which held the orchid, a faint perfume floated to him from the massed golden braids at the nape of her white neck. He raised his hand, then let it drop to his side. The orchid does well enough. Shall we sit down a while until Mrs. Van Ryn comes? He indicated the filigree iron bench against the south wall where there were massed oleanders and hibiscus. Beside the bench, water trickled from a lion's mouth into an alabaster basin, thus evoking in the steamy room the cool, fresh sound of a forest. It occurred to her that at last she had a moment alone with him in which to ask about Zélie. She had seen nothing of the old woman since the inexplicable midnight interview, and time had erased the impression of eeriness, but she was curious. 
She brought out her timid question, and Nicholas turned sharply. You've seen Zaylee? Where? She gave a brief account, suppressing some of Zaylee's more fantastic utterances, which now sounded extremely silly. Did she frighten you? asked Nicholas, frowning. A bit, though I don't know why. There was a lot about somebody laughing in the red room and me bringing... bringing badness. I know it's all nonsense, she added hastily, hoping he wouldn't laugh at her. He was not amused. He was annoyed. She's really getting impossible with her claptrap. I'd no idea she'd ever venture upstairs. I shall speak to her. But who is she? said Miranda, persisting in the face of his evident wish to close the subject. Nicholas stood up, and she saw with dismay that her insistence had spoiled the rare moment of intimacy. The old hag must be ninety. It's time she died and her stupid tales with her. She was astonished at the venom in his tone, but he went on more quietly with controlled irritation. My great-grandfather, Peter Van Rin, married a New Orleans belle in 1752. Her name was Azilda Marie de la Corbeille. He brought her back here, and with her her body slave, Tatine. Zélie is the daughter of the Black Tatine and a Mohican Indian. She's always lived here at Dragonwick. She talks so queerly ventured the girl after a moment, feeling that what she had heard was no explanation at all. She speaks with a Creole patois she learned from her mother, I suppose. I, I, I didn't mean that. I mean the thing she says, spooky things. And I remember now. It was Azilda, she said, would laugh again. Nicholas shrugged. <laughs> There's some ridiculous legend kept alive by Zélie. Azilda was not happy here. After the birth of her son, she... he paused. She died, and that's all the basis for the arrant foolishness invented by Zélie involving a ghost and a curse. Now, shall we talk of something more sensible? Did you read those essays by Addison that I suggested? Not yet, she confessed, looking up at him contritely. I'm still reading Ivanhoe. Oh, but it's a grand story, Cousin Nicholas. My dear child, you are an incorrigible romantic. And may I suggest that the English language contains many more appropriate adjectives than grand, of which you seem to be immoderately fond. The embarrassed color flew to her face as it always did when he reproved her. But she saw with startled joy that this reproof was different, for there was no censure in his tone, rather an unexpected lightness as though he teased her and there was warmth in his piercingly blue gaze as he looked down at her. Tompkins announced supper, Nicholas. Johanna, panting a little from the effect of having searched throughout the lower floor, stood in the conservatory archway. As though the flat and breathy voice had been a rock thrown into a still pool, the warmth and the shared instant of subtle expectancy shattered. I'm extremely sorry to have kept you waiting, my love, said Nicholas, in a tone conveying nothing but courteous apology. Miranda and I were discussing literature. Her new dress becomes her, doesn't it? Madame de Clos has done well. Johanna turned and looked at the girl in the green silk dress. The fingers on which a half-dozen magnificent rings made deep channels through the fat twined themselves together, the pale eyes slid back to Nicholas. The gown seems to suit her very well, said Johanna. During the first weeks of Miranda's stay at Dragonwick, there had been an occasional guest, Mr. and Mrs. Newbold en route from New York to Saratoga, the portly Mr. Solomon Bronk, who looked after Nicholas' valuable real estate holdings on Manhattan. But these had stayed only for a night or a meal, and Miranda had scarcely seen them. Now there was to be a Fourth of July celebration at Dragonwick, festivities of dazzling magnitude, a banquet and ball on the night of the Fourth, and a garden party the following day. All of the guest rooms were to be occupied by people whose names meant nothing to Miranda, but she speculated about them with excited interest, particularly the guests of honor, the de Greniers a real French count and countess for whom the Florentine suite in the north wing was being prepared. 
On the afternoon of the 3rd of July, the day boat stopped at Dragonwick and landed the de Grenier. They were a disappointment to Miranda. A French nobleman, fresh from the court of Louis Philippe, would be tall and languid and haughty, like Nicholas, perhaps, only more so. And the Countess! Here Miranda's imagination had run wild, and she endowed the lady with a white wig, satin panniers, and a mournful, high-born beauty, which were patterned on a dimly remembered picture of Marie Antoinette. The reality was a shock. The Count was plump and nearly bald. He was shorter than Miranda herself, and though he had fierce little black mustachios, they were the only impressive thing about him. His round face wore a perpetual expression of amusement. Life was to him a diverting panorama which he richly enjoyed. His speech, and he spoke good English, having spent five years in London, bubbled with wit and, to Miranda's mind, an astounding frankness. This frankness she would have considered shocking vulgarity in any one but a count. "'You have here a most magnifique establishment, mon cher,' said the Count to Nicholas. "'A luxury one would hardly expect in such a new country. "'And your cuisine, madame?' Here he looked at Johanna, his shrewd eyes travelling over her immense bulk in blue silk. "'Your cuisine!' he went on, bunching his fingers together and kissing them gustily, is superb. Johanna put down her fork. Is it true, Count, that you eat frog's legs and snails in your country? she asked seriously, and as he nodded, she said, How extraordinary! No more extraordinary, my love, than the sheep's brains and fish eggs of which we are so fond, said Nicholas. The Count looked around. Tiens, he said to himself, here is something interesting. The man is too polite to his wife. There is a repressed violence about him beneath his calm. Silent for a minute, while the crawfish mousse was removed and the pheasant patty passed, the Count sipped his excellent Romanet Conti and surveyed the party with lively speculation. At the head of the table was this Nicholas Van Rin, whom he had met briefly in Paris years ago, and whose invitation he had been delighted to accept, for it was entertaining to see all aspects of life in the strange new country. Already it had his fill in New York of the hysterical lionizing vouchsafed to all visiting foreigners with the title. He had expected more of the same here, but he saw at once that he had misjudged the Van Rins. The man was a grand seigneur, as self-contained as a Talleyrand or a de Lamballe. nor were his possessions and manner of living apparently inferior to these. And yet the man was not a nobleman. The mere possession of hereditary landed estates could hardly produce a nobleman in this country that shouted so loudly and so belligerently of its perfect democracy. He is then a type of anachronism, perhaps, thought the Count. For a minute he watched Nicholas, who was conversing with the Countess in careful, accurate French. Decidedly the man was good-looking, and must appeal to women except that there was a coldness about him, there was no fire, no sentiment. Still, there might be passion, there was sensuality in that full, compressed mouth. By a natural sequence of thought, the Count once more examined Johanna. But the woman was a cow. She would give no satisfaction at all in bed. Van Rinnen must have a mistress. Though already the Count had learned that these matters were regarded differently in America. They had prudish conventions here. Their English, or in this case Dutch blood, was sluggish, lacking in amorous vehemence. Miranda, said Nicholas suddenly, after supper, will you fetch for the Countess that volume of Mr. Cooper's, which I believe you were reading? She wants to see it. The girl raised her eyes. Certainly, Cousin Nicholas. Sapristi, said the Count to himself. Here is someone I've overlooked. He had accepted Johanna's offhand introduction, gathering that the girl was some sort of governess, and scarcely more than a child herself. She sat in the shadows at the far end of the table, and had not up to this point said a word. The three words that she had now said were not revealing. 
but the unconscious expression of her eyes as she looked at Nicholas was. But she's really charming, said Petite, thought the Count, craning very discreetly so as to see over the mass centerpiece of roses. And she is well on the way to falling in love with Cousin Nicholas. She does not know it yet, nor does anyone else. How bizarre these people are. The fat one had better look out. He chuckled inwardly, wiped his mouth, and said chattily, I am all on the qui vivre to take part in your great Fourth of July celebration tomorrow. What is the day's program, monsieur? Nicholas turned to his guest with his instant polite attention. Why, in the morning we have a party for my tenants, and I fear you must endure listening to a speech from me, since it's a tradition with us. He smiled, and the Count said, A patriotic speech? It will be a pleasure. Nicholas continued, In the late afternoon there will be a banquet, followed by a small ball. We've asked some of our neighbors to meet you. Also a pleasure, monsieur, and I am passionné for dancing. I bounce about like a little gutta perca ball, but I do my best. You must also be fond of dancing, mademoiselle. He deliberately addressed Miranda, who started and changed color. Ah, I, I don't know, she said, confused by the sudden notice. I'm afraid I can't dance well. I don't know the polka or the waltz. I don't believe I'll be at the ball. She looked uncertainly at Johanna, who said, I thought Miranda should stay with Katrina. The child would be upset with so much noise and people in the house. One of the servants may sit with Katrina, said Nicholas. Of course Miranda must be at the ball. She'll soon manage the steps. Oh, well, it makes no difference, answered Johanna, burying a spoon in her vanilla ice. Aha, thought the Count. The fat one is not so stupid after all. She tries to suppress the little one, to keep her in her place. Cousin Nicholas then comes to the rescue, and Mademoiselle's superb eyes caress him gratefully. All this so far is instinct. Madame is perhaps too lazy and too snug to realize what is happening. Monsieur is too much bound by the consciousness of his position to permit himself to realize it. As for the little one, she is not awake, simply as yet a pretty little animal. They all rose, and the Count examined Miranda with a connoisseur's eye, admiring the long, slender limbs, the high breasts outlined by her tight basque, the fairness of her skin. He liked that blonde cendre type. He particularly liked the tiny black mole which emphasized the right corner of her mouth, and the slightly retroussé nose. This type was often capable of great passion. He sighed, wishing momentarily that he might be the means of awakening her. He watched her graceful body as she followed the other two ladies out of the dining room, and its innocent carriage and youthfulness touched him. Pauvre petite! He could teach her the arts of love with a tenderness that she would never get from this Nicholas, for all his handsome face and exquisite manners. Then the Count's sense of humor returned. Eh bien, c'est la vie. The emotional complications of this household were none of his business. He settled down to a superlative port and conversation with his host, whom he found to have broad knowledge and well-expressed opinions on any subject. They touched on foreign affairs, France's Moroccan War, England's recent peace with China, the foundation of the German Catholic Church. They passed quickly over the proposed annexation of Texas and the possibility of James K. Polk's winning the presidential election. Here the Count found himself out of his depth, so that Nicholas tactfully introduced the topic of science, in which the Frenchman was an amateur dabbler. "'What do they think in France of these new experiments with ether?' he asked, changing the subject. "'Ah!' That is a miracle indeed. If it works, it will stop so much pain. And it will provide a most easy death for those who deserve it. And those who are murdered deserve to be murdered? asked the Count, amused. Nicholas's eye lingered a second on the other's face. Perhaps, he said, 
There's a vast amount of twaddle and sentimentality in the commonplace mind about death. It would be far better for the race if the ugly and useless ones were eliminated. But, monsieur, expostulated the Count, laughing, this is barbaric. Who is to decide which one is ugly or useless enough for death? Who would dare? Nicholas lifted his glass and took a delicate sip. I would dare, if the occasion arose. The Count swallowed. The candles had burned down, and some of them were guttering. The corners of the room flickered in shadow, but such light as there was illumined his host's impassive face. The Count made a secret sign of the cross, and was immediately ashamed of himself. This was no more than the jejune atheistic talk one heard from many a young sophisticate in Paris salons. All the same, he was uncomfortable. There was a small silence. Through the shut door there came the distant tinkle of a gavotte from the music room. He recognized it. His wife must be playing the piano for those other two strangely assorted women. Poor Marie-Louise, he thought. It must be very dull for her, imprisoned with people whose language she does not speak. He longed to go and join them. But Nicholas, for once negligent of a guest's wishes, showed no sign of moving. He sat quiet, abstractedly fingering one of the Madame d'Espray roses which had fallen from the centerpiece. The Count cleared his throat and brought out a topic which he thought would be pleasant. You have a magnificent estate to leave to your sons, monsieur. Nicholas put the rose down. I have no sons. Eh bien, they will come. There is much time yet, said the Count hastily. Nicholas slowly turned his head. You have seen my wife. Do you think she will bear me sons? Quel question extraordinaire, thought the unhappy Count. But apparently one must answer something. Madame Van Ryn has uh, quite a bit of uh, embonpoint, certainly, uh, but that is nothing. Why, the Marquise de Léon weighs ninety kilos, and she has had eight, all boys. One must not be discouraged. And if there is something a little wrong, some petite maladie, why, that is easily fixed. You have good doctors here, I think. He broke off astounded at the expression that came and went so quickly on the other's face that almost he doubted that it was not a trick of the candlelight. Johanna will bear no more children, said Nicholas, and rose at the same time, adding casually, You seemed interested in my Persian oleanders. I have a fine crimson specimen in the conservatory. Would you like to look at it on our way to join the ladies? While he dutifully admired the oleander, the Count was engaged in renewed conjecture, piecing together this last peculiar conversation. Did the man then find his wife so repugnant that he did not sleep with her? Was this his meaning? The fat one was unappetizing, certainly, but when one wanted legitimate sons, one must overlook such matters and do one's best. One can always find an outlet for romance elsewhere— after one has done one's duty. Perhaps, as an older and more experienced man, he would find an opportunity to point out this view to Monsieur Van Ryn. He would seize a chance tomorrow. But the chance never came. Nicholas had allowed himself to be more personal with the Count than he had been with anyone in years, and he was now annoyed at this momentary weakness. The Countess having exhausted her repertoire, the ladies had retired to the green drawing-room, where the men joined them, and after sitting down beside the Countess and while chatting with her in French, Nicholas did what he always avoided. He turned his eyes on his wife and deliberately looked at her. He watched her attempt to respond to the little Frenchman's persiflage while she stifled the yawns which always assailed her after the evening meal— he noted how her scanty hair lay lank, despite Magda's efforts with the curling iron, and how the pink scalp showed beneath the strands. He noted, too, the clumsy coquetry of her glaring rouge, and that she had tried to darken her eyebrows with an unskillfully applied pencil. 
His eyes descended to the pendulous bosom stuffed into the straining blue satin. It supported tonight the Van Rin diamonds, a delicate necklace of the rose-cut gems which had been bought for Azilda by Peter Van Rin. They were fine stones, but they seemed lusterless, as everything, thought Nicholas, which touched Johanna became by some malevolent alchemy tarnished and unkempt. He no longer remembered, or wished to remember, that he had not always viewed her with this pitiless disgust. She had been plump seven years ago at the time of their marriage, but passably pretty. Though she was two years older than he and of a stolid temperament, she had not been unattractive. She was placid and well-bred, from Dutch stock as proud and long-established as his own. Upon his return from the Grand Tour to find himself an orphan, for his mother had died when he was twelve, Nicholas had discovered amongst his father's papers a letter designating Johanna van Tappen as a suitable choice for Lady of the Manor. He had accordingly wooed her, without passion, but without reluctance either. The change had come after the birth of Katrina. The child's sex had been a bitter blow then, but with the eventual certainty that Johanna was henceforth barren, he had withdrawn into a cold and remote endurance, which gradually crystallized into physical repulsion. For three years he had not shared her bed, and during those years she had become as she was now. But she was his wife and the mistress of Dragonwick. To that position he had always given and would continue to give outward respect and punctilious courtesy. He replied to the countess, who had happily embarked on a long account of her children's beauty and sagesse, and seeing that for this fascinating topic she wanted only a listener, Nicholas turned his head a fraction of an inch. His eyelids drooped, and his veiled gaze rested upon Miranda. She sat across the room, her head bent over the embroidery hoops and the same lawn handkerchief on which Johanna had been working Nicholas's monogram. This transfer was at his suggestion, for upon seeing that Miranda was as skilled with the needle as Johanna was clumsy, he had remarked that he thought it foolish for his wife to waste her time, if Miranda will be kind enough to do them. She had, of course, been delighted, and she took great pride in her exquisite stitches and the neatness of the letters which Johanna had bungled. From the silver sconce on the wall above Miranda's head, candlelight fell directly on her hair and burnished it to gold fire. The color and texture of this hair gave Nicholas yet again a sensation of pleasure which was deeper than admiration, a curious pleasure, which had in it both voluptuousness and solace. But for the origin of this sensation he had never troubled to search. Introspection was alien to his nature." He continued to watch the pure oval of the girl's averted cheek, the long white throat and the youthful shadows at her collarbones, while her nimble fingers continued to manipulate the embroidery silk, which had much the same sheen and whiteness as her skin. She had scarcely attended to the conversation, in which as befitted her youth and anomalous position in the household she had taken no part. Her thoughts ran on the anticipated excitement of the ball— Suddenly, in unconscious response to the steadiness of Nicholas' gaze, she raised her eyelids and looked full at him. A shock ran through her. Her heart beat in slow, thick strokes. They looked across the room into each other's eyes for half a second only. Then Nicholas, turning to the countess, said smoothly, "'Ah, that is most interesting, madame. Tell me more about your little blaze.' But Miranda knew that for all the triviality of the incident, something cataclysmic had occurred. Their relationship had changed, and from this point there could be no going back. Chapter 5 Breakfast the next morning was hurried and eaten to the accompaniment of confusion from outside. Nicholas's tenants were beginning to arrive in their rattling farm wagons, 
and there was a constant stamping and whinnying of heavy draft horses, shouts from the men, excited squeals from the children as they spied the carousel and the picnic booths, a quacking and cackling of poultry, and the bleeding of lambs, which had been brought as tribute to the patron. This was one of the semi-annual rent days, and before a Nicholas speech and the merrymaking which would follow it must come business. A platform had been set up under a large tulip tree, and upon it were an armchair, a table, and several smaller chairs. At ten o'clock Nicholas mounted this platform, accompanied by Dirk Dykman, his bailiff, the Count, and Miranda. Johanna had not attended this recurring ceremony for several years. It bored her, and she disliked being gawked at by the yokels, one of whom had once made loud and uncomplimentary remarks on her figure. The man had been punished, not as Nicholas's grandfather would have punished him, by a day in the stocks, but in a more modern way, by confiscating a portion of his farm on which he had been laggard in paying rent. But after this Johanna appeared no more on rent day until the tenants had gone home. The Countess also preferred to remain in her room and rest, but the Count was interested in this feudal custom, and as for Miranda, she was always glad to be near Nicholas and take part in the life of Dragonwick whenever she was invited to do so. Nicholas seated himself in the traditional rent chair of carved oak black with age, for it had come from Holland with the first patron and had been used for this purpose ever since. The bailiff stood beside him, holding a great gold-stamped ledger. He cleared his throat and called importantly, Let the tenants come forward, single file with their payments. The patron is ready. The crowd of farmers, who had been kept on the back lawn by a rope, shuffled, and sheepishly removing their hats, arranged themselves in order. Two of the Van Rin footmen lowered the rope. A wizened little man in brown homespun stepped up to the platform clutching two grey geese and a bumpy sack of potatoes. "'Tom Wilson,' said the bailiff, thumbing through his ledger. "'Hollow farm on the north road. Poultry and potatoes. Ah, correct!' He eyed the geese narrowly. "'Them birds is a mite skinny, Tom. Couldn't you bring no better than that?' The wizened little man shook his head, casting an anxious glance at Nicholas, who sat silently attentive. "'I couldn't do no better, sir. My corn gave out, and the crops is bad so far. We ain't getting enough rain. Sides, my woman, she's powerful sick. She can't feed the poultry like she used to.' Nicholas leaned forward. "'I'm sorry to hear that, Tom. Has she had the doctor?' No, she ain't. She don't hold with no doctors. They won't do her no good. She thinks there's someone witching her. Maybe old Molly Clabber lives down the road. Nonsense, said Nicholas. If she's sick, she needs a doctor. Dykeman, look into this later and report to me. The bailiff nodded. Tom Wilson said, Thank ye, sir, dubiously, and touched his forehead. He deposited the geese and potatoes in a large pen to the right of the platform, and walked over to a keg of beer, which had been provided for the tenants. The bailiff signaled, and another farmer came up. The procedure was repeated. Jed Ribbling had brought a spring lamb, a side of bacon, and a sack of flour ground at the village mill. He, too, was entered in the ledger, placed his stuff in the pen, and joined Tom Wilson at the beer keg. They filed slowly by, the Dutch names, the English names, a scattering of German ones. Nicholas spoke to each one, asking after the help of some member of the family or inquiring into the condition of the crops. Miranda, from her corner on the platform, watched him breathlessly, admiring his infallible memory for names, his detailed knowledge of his tenants' lives, the graciousness with which he said just the right word to everybody. Ma foi, he's like a young king, whispered the Count, leaning over to her. So I have never seen a king so handsome. Oh, yes, she whispered back enthusiastically. He is like a king, isn't he? No wonder they all admire him. The Count suppressed a smile. He was not sure, 
that all the peasants who filed past, depositing their geese and their sheep and their vegetables, were as worshipping of Nicholas as Miranda was. He had noticed sullen looks, and some of the faces had not responded to the patron's undeniable charm and rather condescending graciousness. But they kept on coming docilely enough. Scarcely a dozen farmers were left, and Miranda, whose interest had slackened a little, was wondering if it would be all right for her to join in the kermis, which represented far more gaiety than she had ever seen in her life, when she jerked around, startled by a small commotion. A tall farmer of about thirty stood defiantly below the platform, his hands in his pockets, his underjaw thrust forth. "'Class baker, two bushels of winter wheat and—' began the bailiff, then checked himself angrily. "'Take your hat off to the patron man!' Class raised his grimed red hands and jerked his hat down on his head. "'I take my hat off to no man. I'm a free American citizen.' The bailiff swelled. His fat belly quivered. "'Take your hat off, or I'll knock it off. Where's your rent?' Class turned his back on the bailiff. His small, narrowed eyes fixed themselves on Nicholas's face with a malignance that frightened Miranda, who had not the vaguest idea what it was all about. The Count hitched his chair forward, delighted at this interesting incident in rather dull proceedings. "'I've brought ye no rent, Nicholas Van Ryn,' said Class harshly. "'Nor will ye ever again get so much as a grain of wheat from me.' Nicholas's eyebrows raised a trifle. Except for a slight tightening of the lips, his expression remained as calm as before. Indeed, he said pleasantly, and do you propose to farm my lands and enjoy the many privileges which I allow you without making any return? Klaas's face contorted. He made a violent gesture and turned to the small group of farmers who were yet to follow him. Do you hear him, friends? he shouted, the Dan Patron. He talks of his lands. Tis my own farm he talks of. Twas my father's and his father's before him. For nigh two hundred years the hill farm has belonged to the bakers, and he dares to call it his. The men he addressed shifted uneasily. One of them nodded, another clenched his fist, but they all kept a wary eye on Nicholas, who said softly, But it happens that it is my land and will always be, no matter how long you have been there or intend to stay. Nor may you stay unless you pay your just rent. By God, this is the blackest injustice that ever was. We've paid the worth of the land many times over in rent, and ye know it. There ye sit, lolling in your easy chair, grinding out of us the pitiful little results of our sweat, that we may keep the lands that rightfully belong to us. I'll stand it no longer, I tell ye. And there's many another who feels like me. Ye'll find out, my fine young squire. Class, be reasonable, man, interposed the bailiff with a frightened look at Nicholas. True, he cannot actually take title to the lands, but look what the patron does for you. The church he has built and the mill and the market boats he runs so you may sell your stuff. The doctor he sends when you're sick. Fuh! The farmer filled his mouth with spittle and aimed it directly at the platform. He does nothing for us, ye fat nincompoop, that we could not do better for ourselves. The ball of spittle landed on Nicholas's shoe. He pulled a handkerchief from his pocket, wiped his shoe, and tossed the handkerchief to the ground. Ye crazy fool, cried the bailiff, really alarmed. Have ye no sense at all? No gratitude? Don't you know what will happen? Hush, Dirk, said Nicholas, raising his hand. He rose and faced the little group of farmers. The corners of his nostrils were white and sharply indented. You will all be glad to know that since Klaas Baker feels this way, he need no longer be troubled by living on my land. He will leave the farm tomorrow morning. Doubtless he and his family will find lands to suit them in the West, where they won't be bothered by rents or laws. A stifled gasp ran through the listeners. Klaas choked. His defiant face crumpled. Ye, ye can't. 
You wouldn't turn me out like that overnight, Mr. Van Ryn. Why, we've no place to go. He wet his lips and swallowed. Ah, I, I was born on that farm. He know that, sir. He couldn't be so cruel hard, Mr. Van Ryn. Nicholas looked down at his shoe, then up at the farmer. Since you are dissatisfied here, you will doubtless be happier elsewhere. You may apply to Dykeman after the Kermis. I shall authorize him to give you some gold pieces. The man's face twisted, turning a dull red. I don't want no charity. I won't go. You'll see. I've got friends. You, you'll be sorry for this. We'll break up your damn manor. His voice trailed off as Nicholas looked through him. He shuffled slowly back to the wagons. After a moment, he picked up the reins and his horse started wearily down the road. There was a dead silence around the platform. Then Nicholas spoke. Will the remaining tenants come forward with their rents? The men did not look at each other, but came quickly. Gebhard, a cousin of Klaus Baker's, was empty-handed. The bailiff cleared his throat. More trouble. Miranda leaned forward anxiously. How could they treat Nicholas like that when he did so much for them, watching out for their interests, providing them with his beautiful kermis? It was so unfair. Wicked, vulgar men, she thought angrily. Surely this Gebhard would not also refuse to pay his rent. Nor did he. He stood uncertainly a moment before the platform, shuffling his hobnail boots and staring at the ground while Nicholas waited. Then, still not looking above the base of the platform, he removed his hat and mumbled something about an accident to the farm wagon and added, I'll bring the stuff tomorrow, sir, if that will suit. Certainly, said Nicholas, that will do very well. I've no wish to be hard or unreasonable, Will you call the others from the care, Miss Dykeman? I want to say a few words to my tenants, as usual. The bailiff bustled off and lumbered amongst the merrymakers. The patron is going to speak. Come to the platform, all of you. They straggled up reluctantly, loath to leave the fun, but they came. They gathered around their lord, as they had been accustomed to do, and as the manor tenants had always done. Nicholas, looking down at their faces, was reassured. There had been rebellions before on the manors, small ones, quickly dissolved. This new unrest would be equally easy to handle by a blend of firm authority and tactful kindness. There could be no real disaffection amongst them. They were his people, attached to his land. They felt for him an affectionate loyalty— just as he felt for them a paternal responsibility which embraced their physical and material welfare, and, if necessary, their discipline. The discipline he had administered to class, and he knew that word of this had run through the group. It was time now for a lighter, more sympathetic note. So he bowed to them and began, Tenants of Dragonwick, I am more than happy to welcome you all today on this glorious anniversary of our nation's independence. And I won't keep you long, because I know you're anxious to be back at your sports and games. Whenever you feel hungry, I hope you won't hesitate to help yourselves. My servants will supply you with food, and there are two sheep roasting on the spit behind the carousel. Our own sheep very like, thanks for nothing, murmured a feminine voice near Miranda, who looked about indignantly but could not identify the speaker. She could not tell whether Nicholas had heard or not, for he went on smoothly, and to her very movingly, to talk of patriotism, the beauties of their country, its superiority to all others. For I have traveled in many, and have a basis of comparison, said Nicholas. He went on to assure them of his interest in their welfare, telling them that he was always ready to help with their problems. It is surely unnecessary for me to enumerate the great advantages that you, as manor tenants, have over the struggling and insecure little farmer who has an empty title to his acres. It would never even occur to me to mention this, were it not that I've heard that a few 
misguided men on other manners, has seen fit to render themselves ridiculous by masquerading as Indians in calico nightshirts and trying to inflame the tenantry against their landlords. I know you all, your staunch integrity, your sense of fitness, too well to fear that any of you could be inveigled into any such childish mummery, so I'll say no more about it. He ended with a few more sentences, wishing them health and happiness, and directing them to enjoy themselves well at the kermis. There was a splatter of hand-clapping, one quavering cheer, God bless the patron, but for the most part they flocked silently back to the kermis ground. Miranda saw the suppressed dismay in Nicholas's face, and she grew warm with sympathy. She did not know that he was remembering former times, when his father's speeches had produced a frenzy of cheers and foot-stampings, a passionate surge of loyalty. The manorial system was bred in Nicholas. He saw in it no inconsistency, no aspect which anyone might legitimately criticize. It annoyed him that they did not realize that the very modest rent payments which he required were only a symbol and an hereditary custom. Certainly their poultry and vegetables represented no valuable revenue, whatever they might have done in his great-grandfather's time. Nicholas, thanks to real estate holdings in the city, and thanks to the pleasing way in which wealth begets wealth in a developing country, was a very rich man. His tenants were of no financial use to him whatsoever, rather the contrary, in fact. But he would have cut off his right hand rather than sell one piece of his manor, though since the revolution there was no longer a law forbidding him to do so. He watched them all, enjoying the music and games which he had provided, glutting themselves on his beer and food. Then, turning, he met Miranda's eyes. She lowered her lashes quickly, having already learned that one did not offer sympathy to Nicholas. At once his brown eyes resumed their characteristic opaque blueness, and his mouth thinned into its usual line. But he had not resented her sympathy. He smiled slowly and took her arm. You must be tired, Miranda. We've all been up so long. Wouldn't you like to rest a while, so that you will be fresh and very beautiful tonight? She did not want to rest. She wanted to join the Kermis. But she shivered a little at his unaccustomed touch and the new caressing note in his voice. I'm afraid I could never be very beautiful, Cousin Nicholas she said, looking at him through her lashes with the first hint of coquetry she had ever used. But perhaps it would do me good to rest. Nicholas kept her arm as he helped her from the platform, and he bent down and said quickly, I believe you are far more beautiful than you realize. The Count, trailing along a little behind them, heard this and thought, So, monsieur, we are waking up a bit. Matters are progressing faster than I expected. And he yawned, for the sun was hot. That evening, when Miranda had completed hours of excited preparation for the party, she revolved before her mirror, and her heart swelled with a new sensation of power. All of Madame Duclos' clothes had been successful, needing but a touch here and there from the girl's clever fingers— but the rose satin ball dress was a triumph. The hair brooch looked well enough on the blonde lace, which filled in the low décolletage, though Miranda no longer thought the brooch as elegant as she once had. Before she pinned it to the lace, she gazed at the intertwined strands and felt a pang of homesickness. How lucky I am, she thought, vainly powdering her cheeks, which were unfashionably flushed with excitement, the excitement was increased when a footman knocked on her door and presented her with a bouquet of flowers especially ordered by the patron. Rosebuds, tiny mauve orchids, and maidenhair fern. How like him, she thought joyfully. She had been longing for some ornament to put in her hair. She fastened a nosegay on either side of her face above the ringlets and sewed the rest to a velvet band for a bracelet, 
Then, sure that she could hold her own with any fashionable lady, she gave a last tug to the precious hoop, lifted her shoulders, and undulated into the hallway. The sliding doors between the green and Italian drawing rooms had been opened. Both of these great chambers, the library, and even the small red room were filled with people moving to and fro, greeting each other, chatting a moment, and passing on to other groups. Johanna, enthroned in a gold chair near the entrance to the green drawing room, was behaving with unusual animation. A tall man with ginger-colored whiskers bent over her flatteringly while she flirted her fan and smiled and talked with an archness Miranda would have thought impossible. The lady of the manor was overpowering in yellow brocade, especially chosen to set off the most splendid of the Van Rin jewels, a ruby pendant set in a sunburst of seed pearls and diamonds. They were all admiring this jewel the man with the ginger whiskers and several other ladies and gentlemen who came up to pay court to the hostess. Miranda, standing helplessly in the doorway, not knowing what to do, heard them all begging for the history of the stone, which had come from India to Amsterdam in the seventeenth century, and complimenting the wearer on its becomingness. Indeed, Johanna did look unusually well tonight, impressive rather than gross. Once she turned her head and her eyes rested for a moment on the unhappy girl in the doorway, who was suffering the painful embarrassment of the young and uncertain amongst strangers. Johanna neither beckoned her over nor gave any sign of greeting before turning back to her friends. Miranda backed from the doorway with a confused notion of flight, then stopped as Nicholas crossed the hall from the red room. For a second they looked at each other silently. In a dark blue suit, relieved by cascading white ruffles and stock, he was more strikingly handsome than he had ever been, and in that second under his unsmiling gaze her misery vanished. His eyes were inscrutable as he said quietly, The flowers become you, Miranda, as I thought they would. Come, I want to present you to my friends. He paid no attention to her nervous protest. Oh, no, please, I wouldn't know what to say. But taking her arm, ushered her through the drawing rooms, pausing at each group. This is my cousin, Miss Miranda Wells. The faces, some kindly, some indifferent, some appraising and faintly hostile, were a blur through which the names floated disembodied. There were a great many Van Rensselaers, Livingstons, Schuylers, and many more which she did not hear at all. The only two who penetrated the blur were Mr. Martin Van Buren, the ex-president, a bald elderly gentleman in plum satin, and his son John, who turned out to be the tall man with the ginger whiskers to whom Johanna had been talking. These she curtsied to with respectful awe. Her shyness had lessened by the time they had been the rounds, but then Nicholas settled her with a group of young ladies by the fireplace and left her. And without his support, she was again at a loss. The three young women with whom he had left her all seemed to be Van Rensselaers. They made a few coldly civil remarks, then sped back to an unintelligible conversation about dear Cornelia's wedding. She sat, ignored and forlorn, until Tompkins, red with importance, announced to Johanna that dinner was served. At once, a pleasant-faced young man of about twenty-five came up, bowing. "'Miss Wells,' he said, "'I believe I'm to have the pleasure. I'm Harmon Van Rensselaer.' She smiled timidly and took his arm, wondering what in the world one said to a dinner partner for hours and hours, and praying that he wouldn't guess that she had never been to a real party in her life. But she need not have worried. Harmon was a lively young man, fond of talk, and the evident admiration that she saw in his eyes restored her confidence. 